Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Drew of Lone Fox, and today's video is going to be jam-packed with projects, so I hope you guys are ready. Now, I've been making interior design and home content for about five, almost six years, I believe, on this channel, and I've done so many IKEA hacks videos. I think I've done probably around 25 to 30 IKEA hacks videos, where I've shared taking products from IKEA and then essentially converting them into something new, and I have converted so many random items from IKEA, ranging from like the smallest little cups to massive dressers and cabinets. I've mentioned in the past that I love how simple and customizable a lot of IKEA items are, and that is why I create these videos, and you guys seem to love them as well. So I thought I would break down my top 10 most favorite, doable, time-worthy DIY projects that are not going to break the bank. They are not super challenging to recreate, but the outcome of the project is so worth it, because I know sometimes DIYs, you like get into the process, and you're like, gosh, what have I gotten myself into? I've done that multiple times in the past, so I wanted to go through a lot of my past videos, pick out 10 of my absolute favorite projects, the ones that I actually, a lot of them still have to date, such as my bookcase I actually did with Architectural Digest, which is crazy to say. It is an IKEA hack. I'm going to share it in this video, but it is such a great, great project because it's not hard to recreate, but the actual bookcase in the end is stunning. And before jumping into project one, I do want to mention that today's video is kindly sponsored by Helix. And you guys know I've been working with Helix for many years now. I absolutely hands down love Helix. And if you're in the market for a mattress, especially now that the holidays are coming, up, I do feel like a mattress is like one of those gifts that you can get yourself. If you don't know what to get yourself this year, or even someone else, of course, like I'm not saying you have to gift yourself something. A mattress is always like an afterthought, but when you actually think about it, you're spending a third of your life on your mattress, like literally. So investing a little bit in a mattress, which Helix mattresses are such a great price point regardless, is something your body's going to thank you for. I know mine has. I've actually had my Helix mattress, the one behind me here, for many, many years now. I think I've had this one for like five years. My parents have one. My aunt has one. Even my friend Kelsey who has muscular dystrophy. We got her a Helix mattress and she absolutely loves hers. The mattress is shipped directly to you in a box and it's actually based off of an entire sleep quiz that you get to fill out yourself and it pairs you up with a mattress that's perfect for your body. So it's nothing where you're kind of like blindly ordering a mattress. You don't know what you're going to be getting. This is a mattress that was picked out and selected for you based off of how you sleep and your preferences. And then it is shipped in a handy box right to your doorstep and you can just take it right up and unbox it. There is free shipping within the US, a 10 year warranty plus flexible payment plans and financing options because I do know that a mattress can be an investment purchase, but do keep in mind you really do spend so much time on your mattress. So having a nice quality mattress is incredible. Plus Helix offers a hundred day sleep trial, meaning that if it isn't for you, they just come back and pick it up right at your doorstep and you get a refund for your mattress. And I really want to stress the point that even though I am sponsored by Helix, I genuinely absolutely love my Helix mattress, and so many of you do as well. I've received so many messages, so take advantage of this incredible Black Friday promo that they're offering. Head to helixsleep.com slash Drew Scott, enter code helixpartner27 to get 27% off of your mattress purchase, plus two free pillows, and receive a free bedding bundle with your Lux or Elite order. A lot of the projects that you're going to see have actually kind of come to fruition while laying in bed, <laughs> believe it or not. Why don't we go ahead and dive on in to our first project? So these are the frames that we're going to be using for this project. They have like a faux barnwood look on the edge, but they come in a bunch of different sizes and are pretty affordable at Ikea. They also have a mat on the inside as well. So we're going to pop the mat out and the little plastic insert, set these to the side for a second because I'm actually going to be ironing down my fabric that we're going to be putting on the front of this. You're going to want a nice clean finish and this was just a scrap piece of fabric that I had. So once that was ironed down, I used some Gorilla spray adhesive along the entire front and sides of the frame along with the mat as well. And I just placed these on top of my fabric to kind of start attaching to the fabric and drying down. That way we can move into the next step of actually wrapping them. So I cut out the edge and then we're starting off with the frame here, just pressing this along the front um, while that adhesive was still wet and then starting to kind of wrap the edges, very similar to a present if you can imagine. So I'm just pulling the edge, making it nice and taut and then on the back side using a little bit of hot glue to secure that down um, on all four sides. We're not worrying about the corners yet. You just want to make sure that 
you're pulling nice and taut that way it looks really smooth in the end so once you have all four sides secured down the corners all you're going to do is just kind of pull them at a diagonal and they naturally flow to the back of the frame and then I just use a little bit of hot glue to secure that down on the back side and then you're gonna cut off all of your extra fabric which in the end is going to make it look nice and seamless and I also go in with my hot glue gun and kind of use the tip just to melt down the edge of that fabric with a little bit of glue to make sure it's not gonna fray anywhere now on the inside you do want to cut out about probably a quarter to a half inch away from the edge that way you can wrap this fabric onto the inside of the frame so using a little bit of hot glue I just tucked those little edges or flaps from the interior where the actual art or the picture goes and I'm wrapping that fabric up on the inside thankfully this will all be hidden so it doesn't have to look too perfect now when I flip this over I was pretty shocked with how great this upholstered frame was looking for the mat all you have to do is wrap the interior section so doing the same exact thing by cutting away from the edge about a half of an inch snipping the corners and then just folding those edges over to wrap the inside and then for the mat you can just cut away the edge because it's going to be concealed on the inside of the frame so popping that in right there and this is how that looked in the end with the mat and then adding in the art as well imagine these in like a little gallery wall or something but they're also so statementy and can stand alone on their own I just love the possibilities with these I also created a larger one the larger one really shows how great the fabric looks on the mat and the frame imagine also mixing up the fabric like doing a different one on the mat and then a different one on the frame that could be so cute this table project I'm using this LAC TV bench which is only $25 at Ikea I am not using the shelf in the center and then this right here is roof closing trim now you can find this in the roofing section at Lowe's I have a feeling SDIYers are gonna get our hands on this and the roofing people at Lowe's are gonna hate us it's gonna be sold out oh well anyways I am going to be putting this on the front of the LAC table and actually just marking where I want to do my cuts now you are going to need to miter the edges because on the top of the table you're gonna want your trim to wrap around the exterior so I'm mitering them outwards if this makes sense so as you could see across the entire edge of the table I have that trim then a mitered edge on the outside I also wanted to make sure that where I'm placing the trim is even on either side so that's why I'm actually holding the trim up to the table as opposed to just measuring the length I need I just wanted to make sure that it would fit and here is an example of how those mitered corners fit together now for the legs I'm just cutting it at the skinniest section of the trim which is kind of the dip in the wave and then I'm measuring it to the length that I need and then just cutting an additional eight of those I'm just adding the trim pieces on the exterior pieces of the legs it just minimizes the amount of trim that you need but you can add it to all four sides of the legs if you want to however I'm just showing you guys um, with adding it on the exterior so this stain here is the Puritan pine color and it really looks so good highly recommend this color if you are wanting to recreate the same table that I did it looks great with the black Ikea lac base as well so I stained all of that trim the sides of it and the front of it that's gonna actually be shown and this is what that looked like once it was stained it actually stains really beautifully it kind of has a highlight to it which I love and I'm going to be placing this on the front of the table towards the bottom uh, for the top section and then I'm just using a brad nailer to nail this down but you can also use liquid nails um, or just like a little hammer and nails if you have one of those as well you do not need a brad nailer for this project but since I had one I figured it would just be the easiest way to attach this trim super quick and simple you could probably also use wood glue if you wanted to so I just used a couple of brad nails all the way across added my trim piece around and then where the corners meet up of course they're not going to be perfect just because it is that scallopy trim so I'm using a sander to just sand down those corners and give a smooth finish to the corner as you could see here it looks really nice and clean and I did add a little bit of stain over the top of that just to make it match the rest and then I'm adding the rest of the trim pieces onto the legs and this is what I meant by the outside like just the two outer edges of the leg I'm adding the trim on but you can add it to all four if you'd like to I just wanted to share with you how to make this table at the most affordable route which was this way and it only cost us under $60 to create this so cute
here. I found this Ivar cabinet, Ivar cabinet at the as is section in Ikea. It was only $49 and I was like, let's go ahead and flip this. I had a vision in my head right when I saw it. And what I went ahead and did was I measured the length of the front of the door first because I found these half inch wooden dowels at Lowe's. They were $4.50 per eight foot section. And I ended up getting about 21 of these for the entire project. However, if you do have the skill set to cut down a piece of plywood into half inch sections, you can totally do that as well. I just do not have the capability to do that. So I bought these half inch dowels and what I am doing is I'm first cutting them to be the exact height of my cabinet door fronts. Now the door fronts are actually a little bit different than the side pieces for some reason. I'm not sure why because they look pretty similar, but I ended up cutting a lot of these for the door fronts and then we're also going to be cutting them for the side pieces as well. But what we're going to start off by doing is just placing our farthest left little dowel section on and using a nail gun to nail it down. Now I started off with using one and a half inch nails, which ended up resulting in the nail going through the other side like this. So I ended up going back to Lowe's and I picked up some one inch nails, which as you can see are much shorter and they were perfect. So once I got back, I was able to continue on and this is actually a very simple process. All you have to do is place down one of your wooden dowels as a spacer and then place another dowel right next to it, butting it up to your spacer piece and then nail down your piece of wood and then pull out the spacer if that makes sense. I feel like this is a very hard thing to explain. It's a little bit more simple if you kind of see what I'm doing on the screen here. But basically what I'm doing is I'm placing down my wooden dowel and there's a spacer in between where I'm going to be spacing out the wood. So basically every half inch there is a wooden dowel stapled out. However, it's just much easier to use a wooden dowel as a spacer since I want everything to be very symmetrical as well. So I finished the entire front of this cabinet by nail gunning down all of the wooden dowels across the front of it. And once this is stained, you can really see that texture. But as a light wood like this, it's kind of hard to tell. So I repeated the process across the other front door and you can kind of see how I'm doing it a little bit easier here. We are then going to go ahead and repeat the process on the sides as well because the main sections that are going to be showing are the sides and the top. So I cut out the wooden dowels and I repeated the same exact process by cutting them down and then nail gunning them to the side of the cabinet, both the left and right side. to go ahead and create the base for this which I really think elevates the whole piece so I grabbed these one by sixes and I cut out two pieces that were 27 inches and two pieces that were six and one quarter inch basically we're gonna be creating a box on the bottom using some of these two and a quarter inch screws very similar to my bench tutorial if you guys remember this is just such a simple woodworking technique not even a technique because this is nothing crazy at all I don't even know what I'm doing but it seemed right in my head so basically what I'm doing is I'm screwing through our longer sections into our shorter sections and we are going to be creating a wooden box which is then going to be underneath our cabinet and prop it up and kind of give it a level of interest and I just knew I needed to add some more detail to that bottom section as well so what I did was I cut down these spare ending pieces from the dowels I cut originally I cut them down to the same exact height of our little box section that's going to be the base of our cabinet and I stapled them around using the same exact technique Now comes time to attach the pieces together. So of course I didn't add those little detail sections to the back side because no one's going to see that, but I'm going to be using these little L brackets here. I picked these up at the hardware store. Um, there's just simple two little screws that go on each side and it's going to be attaching our legs or the base to the cabinet itself. So I just went ahead and I added four of these all around the entire interior of the box. That's why I loved creating the box because it allowed me to easily attach these in. Once you have that on there, it's nice and sturdy and good to go. And of course we went a nice clean finish before staining so I grab this stainable wood filler and I'm going to fill all of our little brad nail holes and once that's dried down just use a nice fine sandpaper to remove any of that filler residue over the top. Mm -hmm. 
So here you can see what we are working with so far. I am so obsessed with the base of this, but you really can't see the details. So I'm going to make this pop using some true black wood finish by Minwax. This is just like a wood stain. And I went in with a stain brush and I went around and painted the entire exterior, every single nook and cranny with this stain here. Now guys, I do suggest wearing gloves for this because I got it all over my hands and they were stained like crazy afterwards. However, it was totally worth it because this project turned out amazing in the end. And when I initially painted on the black wood stain, it was so dark, but as it dried, it kind of soaked into the wood and you can really see the wood grain through it, which is something I really wanted to see through was that wood grain while it still had that kind of like dark black wood look, if that makes sense. I let the stain dry overnight just so that it could really penetrate the wood. And then in the morning I went ahead and I grabbed a drill and I'm going to be drilling through the front to add some handle pulls. Originally I wasn't gonna do this, but I loved these ones that I found at Lowe's. They were just like such a soft, warm toned, like golden silver color. They were just really pretty. They're almost like a champagne tone and that just finished off this cabinet. I love the outcome. For the supplies for this project, we're gonna be using the Sluka coffee pot, and then I'm using the Blonda bowl, this is the 11 inch size, and then the Barlast table lamp. And we're mainly using this for the electrical components because it's only $7.99. Now with the coffee pot, I'm actually gonna be cutting the handle off, and I know I aggressively just pulled out a saw, but it's way easier to cut off than it actually looks. It just comes right off, and I'm using this little tabletop vacuum. I've had this in my stash for like years, and I always pull it out. It's from Amazon, highly recommend it if you are a DIYer, so thought I'd just it with you guys if you have not seen that and then I'm putting the actual little lamp together this is just such a cheapy little lamp from Ikea but it works perfectly for this project because we're gonna be covering all of it up and once you actually kind of create the entire lamp I realized I needed to cut the shade down a bit in order for the bowl to fit on top of this nicely and kind of conceal all of the components then I got pliers out and started to pull off the top and it popped right off which was great and it's not actually glued on so if you use a little bit of force it will pop right off now now with our lamp, I'm actually gonna unscrew the post in the center because we're gonna be gluing this directly onto the metal base itself. And the adhesive that I'm using is called JB Weld. I'll link it below. I get mine at Lowe's or Home Depot just in the glue section, but you can also get it on Amazon, so I'll link it for you guys. And with this product, you mix it together and it's basically like an industrial strength epoxy adhesive. I'm applying it to the points that are actually going to hit the top of the base, which is a coffee pot, gluing that down and then using some tape just to hold it while it cures and it only needs a couple hours to cure which is nice so once that is done I just cut off the tape from the inside and this is kind of our lamp base which you can see the shape coming together pop the bowl on top and this is just gonna sit on top like that I mean you could glue it if you wanted to but I just placed it on top and I think it's totally fine as is I love the way that this turned out and for only $45 for the complete project I think that is such a great price it looks incredible using these bamboo salad mixing bowls that I feel like everyone has seen at Ikea in the past. And I also picked up this JB Weld product, which is like an epoxy weld. It's just extremely strong adhesive essentially, but you're gonna need six of these bowls because we are gonna be making three ball shapes out of the bowls. So I'm just taking the epoxy and it actually pre-mixes itself in the little spout that it comes out of, which is really cool. And I'm gonna be gluing the bowls together just like this. So adding the epoxy around the top edge Edge, and then just placing the bowl on top making sure that it's perfectly centered and then letting that cure down for about an hour before we go in with some wood filler. Now I actually saw somebody on TikTok create some wooden balls out of these bowls a while back so I wish I found the video or was able to locate the original video but I loved the concept of creating these wooden balls. I think she used them as decor pieces but I'm actually going to be using mine as coffee table legs. Once that has 
secured down, you should have three wooden balls looking just like this. So we're going to be using some of this stainable wood filler, and I like the one in the tube for this process just because it's thinner and I feel like it works quite a bit better. So I'm just going around the seam there and actually adding some wood filler in and just making sure that I'm smoothing it out, but make sure you add an excess because you're going to want to have enough wood filler to where when you go and sand after the fact that the wood filler actually is going to be flush with the bowls and it's not going to be sitting underneath and creating that seam so make sure to add more than you actually think you do Now here's where you can spend more money or less money. I just picked up a 4x4 piece of plywood, which of course is not the best wood for a tabletop, but I want to share with you how you can make it beautiful because it's only $45 for a 4x4 piece, so I actually just drew out a very organic circle shape, and I'm going in with my jigsaw, and I tried to use up as much of that 4x4 board, that way you get that large tabletop because you don't want it to be a small tabletop with those large chunky ball feet, you really want to have that scale kind of proportion that you know so once I cut out my shape I went in with a orbital sander and this is where purchasing plywood is going to not come in very handy because you are going to need to sand the edges like crazy along with the top to get it nice and smooth so I started out with an 80 grit then I went to a 100 grit then a 120 and I finished everything off with a 180 grit and I did this on the edges and the top but this is how you're going to get a nice smooth base and I really do love the graining on plywood I think it's really interesting but you could always opt for purchasing just a better quality piece of wood that when you cut it out already sanded down and ready to be kind of finished. Once you let your wood filler dry down for a couple of hours, you could bring our wooden balls outside and we are going to sand these down the same exact way, starting off with an 80 grit, then going to a 120 and finishing off with a 180 just to get all of that sealer off the top of these bowls because these are originally used for food. So you could put things like, you know, soups or liquids inside of these bowls. So we want to get the sealer off so that it can actually absorb our stain. So this is what it starts to look like. And I also love seeing like kind of the checkerboarded bamboo under these. I could totally see see myself using one of these as just a decorative object in the future because once you sand it down completely it's a really really beautiful almost like white oak color Now, since our plywood is pressed and the edge is not very pretty, I'm actually going to be using a edge banding along with an iron, and you can pick this up at really any hardware store, and it's basically like a wood veneer that has glue on the backside, and when you place it on and iron it, it heats up the glue and melts it onto the side of your piece. So a lot of IKEA furniture has edge banding on it, and this is just going to give our plywood a nice clean edge, but again, if you did get a better quality piece of wood, you wouldn't have to use anything like this. I just wanted to share with you how to make this the cheapest possible way. And I'm going to go in with Minwax's pre-stain first. Since this, again, is plywood, I want to get the best possible finish that we can out of this. So I'm going in with the pre-stain. This is just going to condition the wood and make sure that the stain that we actually do apply goes on really even and smooth. So I'm going to apply this coat first. And once that is all applied, I'm going to put it on the sanded down balls as well because we are going to go in with stain right after this. I'm going to be using the English Chestnut Stain by Minwax, and I will say that I thought this was going to turn out quite a bit darker when I put this on, but the plywood really sucks it up kind of indifferently in different parts of the grain, so plywood has a tendency of not really staining properly, but we're going to go in with the gel stain that's quite a bit darker and even out the finish in the end, so do not worry. I'm going in first with the English Chestnut color, and it really adds this kind of orangey warmth to the top of it, but here you could see how grainy it is. It actually is but the way we're gonna fix that is with some gel stain so gel stain is quite a bit more intense than just traditional oil stain so I'm going to put this layer of gel stain over the top these are our new staining gloves hopefully you like them because <laughs> we just go through so much gloves I was like let's just get an actual pair that we could continuously use for staining so stained the tabletop and then just went in and also stained the balls as well and they actually stained up really really nice I was kind of scared when we first applied this it was getting dark and then also kind of splotchy 
stretchy, but after the second coat of this stain, they actually evened out really well, and the line in the center also really kind of diminished after the second coat as well. You could see this is what it looked like when one of them was dry. I'm just bringing it in and setting it down. This is going to be one of the legs of our table. Then I'm bringing in the second one, and I'm also bringing in the third one, but the camera freaking stopped recording when I brought that in, so that was rude of it. But once you have all three of the balls in place, you actually are going to use more of that welding material that we used at the beginning to attach the bowls together. This one is an unmixed one, so I just mixed it on top just with the back of a paintbrush, and once that was nice and mixed up, we set the tabletop on top to let it start curing. And because I'm impatient and wanted to share this video with you guys sooner, I didn't end up putting a sealer on it or a top coat, but you totally can put a top coat on it as well. I've done that with all of my past furniture pieces that I've created, and I will be doing that with this piece too, but I ended up styling it up, and this is how the coffee table ended up looking like. For this rug project, I got three different sizes of painter's tape, and this is actually all the tape that I used for the entire project. Now, as you can see here, I got the rug for $59.99, and this is what it looked like. They actually do sell this rug still if you are interested, and it is such a beautiful rug. I don't know why I've never noticed this one from Ikea in the past. Now, what you're going to do with this is so forgiving and simple. You are literally going to be creating varying stripes. Now, keep in mind, you're going to want your stripes that you're going to be adding the paint to to be rather thin. Thin. You're going to want the plaid to be a little bit more of the color to be on the thinner side and more of the jute to show through. That's going to give you kind of more of a natural overall blend when you add the lines in the opposite direction. So with the varying widths of tape, you're able to create different sizes of lines. And then the areas, of course, that you are adding the tape are not going to get painted. So I started with the lengthwise first and added all of those tape strips. And Justin helped me out with this process. It went pretty quick. We probably did this entire section in 20 minutes and the rug is also woven on a grid so you can just follow the lines in the actual rug as opposed to having to measure anything so it's really really forgiving like you can see how straight we got these without having to measure at all then I brought this outside and I'm actually going to be using this primer here it's a rust metal primer but it is the most beautiful rusty tone it is perfect Justin and I've actually used this in a project in the past and we talked about how beautiful of like a reddish terracotta it was so I just went across and sprayed the entire front of this this rug and I did leave some sections a little patchy in a sense to give the rug kind of a variegated stripe look I thought that would be really pretty in the plaid give it a little bit more interest and then once you have all of your stripes on there you can pull it off and I feel like everyone's main question is does this make the rug feel crunchy and the answer is no I don't know what it is but whenever I do this on top of a jute rug the jute just soaks up the spray paint like almost the wetness of the spray paint and just leaves the pigment of the spray paint on the top of the surface and it doesn't transfer for either. It really is incredible. You can even see like when I'm adding this tape on the top of this and spraying it in the other direction, when I pull it up, none of the pigment transfers at all from the spray paint. So we went back inside and then just taped off our plaid in the opposite direction, just very randomly. And in this direction, we actually made the lines thinner because the color is going to be a little more intense. It's this blue shade, which is going to be a bit more vibrant than that red. And I sprayed this on just very randomly. It doesn't have to be perfect at at all because those straight lines that you created with the tape really are going to kind of give that perfection quality to the piece already and these rugs are amazing for the outdoors so if you have a balcony or a porch or an outdoor dining area you can totally make one of these on a jute rug which is perfect for the outdoors as well this reveal process is always my favorite I mean just look how good this plaid looks it looks so good I love the way that it turned out and I'm putting this in my studio storage room which has a big open space in the center which very happy to places in there. We're going to 
be starting off with two of these wooden mixing bowls along with the Hema light cord from Ikea. Now I'm going to go ahead and grab the 1 and 5 eighths inch drill bit from this drill bit set that I have and we're going to be drilling through the top of these wooden bowls which is actually very very simple to do. I'm going to be drilling right through the middle of the large bowl and also right through the middle of the small bowl as well. Now once you have those holes done you're going to go ahead and grab some jute cording or whatever cording that you have and I have these little wooden beads here which I've had in my stash for a while. I'll link the exact ones below for you guys and I'm going to go ahead and just string on probably about 20 to 25 of these beads because we are actually going to be using this as a little accent to detail. So once you have those on your strands we're going to hot glue together our bowls in this fashion here making sure that the holes line up so that our light cord can go through the center and then our little beaded section is actually going to go right around the middle there so you don't have to worry about any excess hot glue because this will totally cover it up. All you need to do is tie your cording together, cut the knot, and the knot will be hidden in the center of those large hole beads there. So this just I think adds such a boho cute little detail and I also wanted to add a little bit of detail to our light cord which I've never done before. I always just leave the light cords as is but for this particular piece I wanted it to kind of have that very natural kind of fiber accent um, that kind of just ties back to the warmth of the bowl. So I went ahead and I wrapped my cording with that jute there and just every about 20 or 30 wraps I suggest is adding a little bit of hot glue. Now in the end I wasn't able to stick this through and screw it together on the opposite side so I added a generous amount of hot glue and I also added more to the top of the pendant um, than you guys can see here and then I went ahead and just to make it look a little bit finished on the inside I did glue on that opposite piece which typically screws in. Add your light bulb and that finishes off this piece. going to be using one of the new like teddy bear shearling throws that Ikea has. These are the Sfindage collection I believe but they have so many of these. They are so insanely fluffy and high quality. I'm also going to be using the Manholt chair which is honestly such a stunning chair as is but we're going to be using this as a base for our project because it's $80 and it's a great kind of structured base and it has these two seat cushions which we're going to be reupholstering in those shearling rugs that we got. Now I ended up getting two of these rugs and overall the cost of this chair is about $120 but when you see it in the end it really is so stunning so what I am using is my electric stapler and if you do upholstery projects often I highly recommend investing in an electric stapler I never knew how handy one of these would be but an actual stapler that you have to use by hand really requires a lot of force so electric staplers once you get your hand on one you're never gonna want to use a normal one again they really work so great and they're really not much more than an average stapler so once you go all the way around you are just going to add as many staples as you can. The nice thing about this fabric is it actually conceals all the staples so you can't even see any of them once you kind of add them. And I flipped it over and it was exactly what I wanted it to look like. So fluffy and it really adds a nice comfort element to the chair as well, I definitely will say. So I'm going to cut out the piece for the back cushion. Now once I'm going to staple this around the outside, the back cushion actually is going to show because it just has like a metal back that it's attached to. So I actually am going to be cutting out another circle from my leftover scrap from one of those rug pieces just using this bowl here that I had on hand also from Ikea to cut out the shape. And I'm just going to staple that directly on top of this section here. Now you are going to have to feel around once you're done for the actual little holes to insert the screws in, but this is what it looks like. As you can see, very seamless. The backside looks great, but I felt around and then I just used my scissors to poke a hole through the fabric and made sure it was wide enough for the screw. I also just put the screw in each of the little holes and screwed it in to make sure that it would properly work before fitting together the base, which the base is just three different pieces. You just pop them together like this and then the seat cushion you just add on like so screw it in from the underside in three different spots and then same exact thing with the back cushion you're just going to screw it in in three different spots as well and that's what I meant by the back showed but as you can see the fabric is so thick and textured you can't see any of those staples and the chair looks absolutely incredible I think this is such a cute dining chair or even like an accent chair for a vanity or desk We 
are using these $10 LAC side tables that I've always asked myself, does anyone really purchase these from Ikea? Because they are so small and I feel like it almost seems like a kid's table. And the hardest part of this entire project honestly might be assembling the three tables from the start. These tables require a lot of forearm strength. You have to twist the legs in and I will tell you, it's quite challenging. But once you get them all assembled, you're going to stack them on top of each other so that it looks something like this because we're going to be turning this into a column and I also use these little brackets that I got at Lowe's. They're just little 90 degree L brackets and I'm using these to attach the tables to each other so I'm adding one of these at every single leg and connection point to the top of the table underneath. And once those are all connected it should look something like this but also be of course secure and one solid piece. Now this plastic sheet I'm using here is called poly wall. You can get this at Lowe's. I use this to create the range hood in my kitchen if you remember and I used it because it's flexible but it's also really thick. It's like a plasticky material and it comes in a four by eight sheet. So what I started off by doing was thinking that I could actually just bend it around the entire exterior but sadly that did not work as planned so I actually ended up measuring each side which of course all four sides were the same and I transferred that measurement to our plastic sheet and then just used some scissors to cut that out and once you have your first one cut out you can actually use that as a template so just place it on top and trace out your next one. Use your scissors to cut that out but this plastic sheet essentially is just a lot easier to use a lot more user friendly than having to cut out wood. I personally hate having to cut out wood for a project so whenever I can get by with something like this I think it's so much easier. And I just used my electric staple gun which is a great investment if you do not have one to secure down the plastic and the finish that we're using is actually called feather finish which is essentially like a concrete finish that a lot of people use on tabletops or countertops. Now this is very similar to that concreta material I used in the bathroom however this is kind of more of a widely known product. I believe you could purchase it at Lowe's and Home Depot. I got mine at Lowe's. You just mix it up with water per the directions. You use a trowel and you just trowel this on whatever you are doing and it's kind of giving you that micro cement finish like a nice concrete look. So I am going to be adding this on the exterior of our column to cover up all the staples. All of the joining of the plastic edges is going to be covered by that cement as well and you could do as many coats of this as you like but I actually only did one thick coat and it looked incredible in the end. And another thing I love about this is that the column in the end only weighs about 15 pounds so it's super easy to move around your house if you're someone that likes to restyle often or if you're even making this for like photo set or something but a real concrete column of course this size would probably be upwards of 200 300 pounds and be quite expensive so I love how we were able to achieve the look for quite a bit less and we're just using the lap bases or tables as forms and then kind of our plastic sheeting as a coat over the top and then we're finishing it off with the micro cement which just looks so great once it ends up drying down I just let mine dry overnight completely and then once it was done brought it outside used a nice 180 grit sandpaper to sand down the top surface it also kind of lightens it up a little bit and that is how I finished off this concrete column Today we are doing a very, very exciting video. I actually got the opportunity to do a video with Architectural Digest a couple of weeks back and I created a bookcase from an Ikea Billy bookcase and it was a really unique bookcase. It had these rounded edges to it, it had this kind of unique bottom. However, the video that Architectural Digest made was more so like following the process and it wasn't really a step-by-step -step tutorial and the amount of people that requested a step-by-step -step tutorial was insane. So I decided today that I'm going to recreate that bookcase step-by-step -step for you guys. This this morning I went to Lowe's and I picked up two pieces of plywood. I got my brackets and screws in here and the pull wrap was actually delivered downstairs which I need to go grab it, bring it up here and we can start working on this project. I never shared with you guys the before bookcase. Now, this is an Ikea Billy bookcase. Well, the inside is, which I forgot to clear out of all of my holiday decor. You guys remember a while back, I actually created these doors on my channel. This was a big DIY project. It was really fun. It's like a rattan hutch situation. But ever since creating the one for Architectural Digest, that one has actually taken place of this one. And I don't particularly need this one anymore. So I'm actually going to deconstruct it a bit and reuse it for today's
today's project. I'm gonna be taking the doors off of it, so we're gonna be using just the bookcase base itself, but I'm gonna repurpose a lot of the materials here and then the bookcase base itself just to create something new. Also, the bookcase I'm gonna be using is the birch veneer finish, which is kind of like the wood finish. However, the one I used on Architectural Digest was just the white one, and we ended up painting that piece. But for this one, I'm actually gonna leave it natural, and I'm hoping that the pull wrap kind of matches the wood. It seemed to from the one I ordered before, but I haven't checked the new one yet. So that's the plan is to actually keep this one fully wood, but of course you could paint it all in the end if you wanted to. All right guys, so the first step of this process is going to be measuring the side of the bookcase, which I already did upstairs and it's 11 inches wide. So I wanna go ahead and create a circle that is 10 and three quarters inches. So what I'm gonna do is lay down a ruler here and just trace out 10 and three quarters inches, like the kind of start and stop of that. And from there, we're gonna find the center point. So I'm gonna do 10.75 divided by two, which is basically like a little bit over five and a quarter. So I'm just gonna find that center point. I'm gonna take a small nail and just hammer it right in that mark that we created. And tie a string to it. From there, you can tie your string to your pencil. And once you have it tied on, I'm gonna use this as a compass to just swing over to our other mark, just like that. And there is our half circle shape. Where we created our first markings, I just drew down an inch and a half, drew a line across, and this is gonna be our shape that we're gonna cut out. We have four of our half circles cut, and these are gonna be placed just as braces on the side, equally down the side of our bookcase. So we're gonna be doing this to both sides, but I just kinda eyeball it and just put them pretty spaced out. So now we're gonna be using these little brackets here. These are L brackets, I got these at Home Depot, and we're gonna be using two of them on the underside here, and then one of them in the middle on the top. And it's kind of just gonna be acting as almost like shelf brackets, and we're gonna be adding our shelf here, then wrapping our pull wrap around, and these are gonna be fastened in with three quarter inch wood screws. I find the easiest way to do this is to actually just flip your piece up like it's attached and then let the brackets fall into place. Hold them pretty tightly and then flip it upwards. And then they're in their right position. And you can just go with a screw and just put it right there. I went ahead and I added the brackets to the wood pieces themselves. I haven't attached them yet to the bookcase yet because I wanted to show you guys something to keep in mind is that you're gonna want your pull wrap to be flush with the front of the bookcase. So as you can see, we have our edge here, which is the front, and I'm going to be pushing back my half circles just a little bit. That way our pull wrap, uh, when we add it, is gonna be flush with the front. It's very similar to the other bookcase that I created, and if it does overhang the backside a bit, that doesn't matter at all because the pull wrap is going to be wrapped around the back, and you're not gonna see that once the wall is covering the backside. So just make sure you push them back just the slightest little bit and screw them to the bookcase. All 
All right, guys, so our pull wrap is cut to size. This is 76.5 inches tall, and this is now going to be wrapped actually around kind of the skeleton that we created. So this is gonna go right around our half circle shape, butting directly up with the top here. So you're gonna make, wanna make sure that it's flush with the top, and then it's gonna end right at the bottom of this shelf piece right here. So to get the desired width that we need to cover this area, I'm just going to kind of butt it up to the edge of our bookcase, wrap it all the way around, and then use a box cutter like this to just trim away the piece that we don't need. I went ahead and I added the first row of nails. You just kind of pull it up a little bit and look underneath for your little kind of skeleton piece and nail it in. Once you have your first set, you can actually flip the whole pull wrap back and kind of use it and roll it up. And it just gives you a better guideline of where that piece is. So then I know that I can staple right here, kind of move it up a little bit, staple again. Um, you're just gonna work your way across the entire piece. All right, we have one half of our bookshelf complete. This half here, it is all nicely stapled down and ready to go. Now what we're gonna do next is flip it on its back and I'm gonna work on the opposite side, attaching all of our little skeleton pieces, then wrapping the pull wrap around that side as well. And that will be the base of our bookshelf completely done. Now this is a really fun idea that some of you guys commented on the AD video actually, and that was about how I should have not even fully attached the pull wrap, but added magnets like here, and then added one up there and on the back side of the wrap. So you could essentially magnet it shut, but then you can open it and there's shelving inside. Just an idea if you wanted to get some extra secret storage. Good morning guys, day two of our bookcase project. Now the great thing about this project is that it totally could have been finished in one day. It's actually a pretty quick project if you have the bookcase already constructed. However, yesterday the sun was going down so I just decided to go ahead and resume today. So this is what the bookcase is currently looking like. Now what I wanna go ahead and do next is actually apply a piece of wood to the bottom of the bookcase. That's going to kind of square off the bottom section and overall give it like a new base to sit on because currently it kind of has like this half base created for it and i'm just not a huge fan of it so i want to put it on top of this so we can add a bit of pull wrap in the slatted section that's kind of open um just to kind of coordinate back and forth then we're going to add some pull wrap to the back of this as well and i also want to see if i can mix up some stain to restain the wood paneling to somewhat match the inside a bit more Now, as you guys can see in the original bookcase I created, there is pull wrap in the back as well. And how I was able to achieve this look was actually just by removing the back panel that was in the Ikea bookcase. So I'm just gonna go through, take out the old nails, and then I literally just rolled out a sheet of pull wrap. It's the same exact height as what we cut it here, which was 76 and a half. Just roll it across the back and then nail it to essentially the shelving that's all the way down. It's gonna reinforce the back a little bit more than the piece that's currently on it, because it's just like a literal piece of pressed cardboard and that is going to finish up the back panel section. Okay guys, so a little change in plans. I was actually planning on staining this piece because I knew I needed to kind of like stain the pull wrap pieces to more so match the Ikea piece itself. Now the Ikea piece is not stainable just because it's a veneer. However, I went through and tried to do a couple of kind of sample stains on um, some excess pull wrap that I had. And this is just some natural stain diluted with water and then natural just as is. Now this is natural stain diluted with mineral spirits and it does add a little bit of warmth to it, but overall I feel like it still just darkens the wood to where it's gonna make it look quite a bit different. And I feel like adding anything to it is just gonna make it even more darker and like more contrasting stand out. So I think I might honestly just leave it as is. But I think this is probably where we're going to be ending this project at, you guys. Uh, now, of course, the one I did on Architectural Digest channel was fully painted, and I just used a shellac primer for that, the Zinzer primer, and then I used a color called Wheat Bread to paint that piece. And I absolutely love that, it's just right over here. 
as you guys can see this one's painted and I feel like painting it really really looks great too so I wanted to do a wood version and I also wanted to do a painted version but I do need to share with you guys the styled reveal of our wooden Ikea Billy bookcase hack so let's go ahead and do that now to the end thank you so much for watching i hope that this gives you some new ideas for ikea hacks that you can go ahead and recreate these are always things to keep in mind too if you happen to be going to ikea you can check the as is section because sometimes they have items there that are far more discounted than actual retail price but they're already built for you and they're in great condition plus if you're gonna diy it you know might as well start off with a more affordable base and that is everything i have for you guys today i would love to know which project was your favorite in the comment section below and also do not forget to check out helix if you're in the market for a mattress. I love my Helix mattress. It's literally shipped to you in a box. It's so convenient, quick and easy, which we love. And I'll catch you guys all in my next one. I think Thanksgiving probably was just yesterday, but happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Have an incredible holiday season and I will catch you in my next one. Bye.